I always remember one of my one of my friends who cycled to Palestine, and I was always in awe of what he did. I was like, wow, you know, he cycled to Palestine, and I was always like, I want to do that. Maybe I should, I will cycle down to Vietnam or so, just maybe go a bit further. And then I sat down and I thought, you know what, maybe I could just sort of cycle around the world. And I thought, that's a possibility. The mental aspect of it is more harder than any physical aspect of the, of the journey. So mentally, it was a case of, you know, you wake up and you think, I've got to cycle another 80 miles or 100 miles or whatever you've got to do. And even then, it's just going to be 80 miles or 100 miles of the same thing. Nothing to do but just cycle. Well, I'm off to the roof of the world. And if there's a, a way of getting to the roof of the world, I guess it's on your own. Cycling through the desert was uh, the most difficult part of this whole journey. Uh, we were we were black, we were burnt, sunburnt, um, dehydrated, and we had no energy in us whatsoever. It was just sand. The majority of the time, we'd have to get off the bike and walk with the bikes. I keep saying, God bless them orphans. God give them orphans a prosperous life. Look after them. Give us the strength and ability to look after an orphan. Because it's our responsibility. And it's for that reason and that reason alone that I'm continuing with the cycle challenge. saying trophies but yeah there are a couple of awards that have been given to the work I've done in the last six seven years uh, I think the first one would probably is this one it's for uh, the Viva, Pal Viva Palestina convoy a lifeline from Britain to Gaza uh, February 2009 and that was actually a medical aid convoy of 107 vehicles and uh, 255 volunteers I also was invited by the president at the time, Ismail Hania, who then uh, awarded me the key to the city as a gesture to uh, my achievement on that convoy. My actual village was probably about 60 mud houses at the time when my father came to Pakistan, from Pakistan. And he was only 13 or 14 when he came. And it was, my dad was literally selling balloons at a, a fair, just to make sure his parents or his siblings would have uh, you know food on, at the end of the night on the table. So from there, someone saw that obviously my father was, uh, he was a worker, he wasn't sitting around, he was trying to. So from there, they basically, someone offered him a ticket or a token or a, however they worked in them days and brought him over to England. And when he got to England, you know, as soon as he arrived in his, in his teenage, he was straight in the mills working and making sure that, you know, instead of work, working in Pakistan with what little they had, he was now working here but still making sure his siblings were, you know, looked after and the rest of the family. That's my father in Pakistan, back in about nearly 20 years ago now. So we went to a wedding out there, and as you can see, the condition of the house is they're very old brick built, and that's probably one of the better ones. And uh, that was about 20 years ago. That was when I went as a teenager, and we went to the wedding there. There's my father, and there's my mother stood there. She looked still quite young, actually. Uh, when I got to London, I was 17 stroke 18, and I just started working out as an estate agent. Uh, I was part of the lettings department, and uh, within about two, three weeks, because of my efficiency and skills of organizing, he put me, basically made me the lettings manager. Uh, he made me the lettings manager. I was earning, you know, six, 700 quid a week, just from commission of letting out the properties. I was good at what I was doing, and but I was 17, 18, so you know, all of a sudden I had six, seven hundred quid a week. I wasn't really looking after it. I was just like, you know, spending it as as needed. So really, just like my the people I worked for, they said, no, listen, you need to start thinking about business and stuff. 
you know, you can set up something now, now you have an opportunity. So I, chatted, you know, I spoke with my brothers and they said, yeah, it's a good idea. I was like, look, I want to do my own thing. So we sort of came together, we put an investment together and uh, yeah, I just went into independent, into the restaurant business and uh, I sort of stopped my studies through that. And then I started, uh, you know, it was very successful. I started moving from one thing to another thing from as far as the restaurants and then into property and stuff, you know, more actively purchasing sort of property, trying to build stuff. Just one day I realized that, you know what, the money in the bank account is now, it's adding up, but I'm not getting time to spend it. And that's when the thought sort of came to my mind and it sort of made me uneasy. And I thought, <clears throat> am I going to do this for the next 50 years? And then I looked around me at all the rich people and I thought, you know, they've sort of lost their ways as far as society is concerned. They're very like, uh, I'm not was selfish, I don't know what's the word, they're very like concentrated on their own life about accumulating wealth and I thought, I don't want to be that person. And I literally rang up my big brother and I said, listen, you need to come to the store. I had a chat with him, I said, listen, you know, I've got about 50, 60 grand in the bank account. This is like 15, 16 years ago and it's only increasing every month. I said, you know, where are we going to go with this? Where do you want to go with it? And he goes, what are you saying? I said, listen, and he thought, he goes, oh, you need a break. I said, yeah, I'm taking a break. So you literally, he has the keys, you know, look after stuff and I'm off. And I just went away for a month just traveling, you know, you know, spending what I'd earn. Okay, so this is in 2003 when I first started traveling around. I was in northern Pakistan, uh, traveling up the country, seeing all the scenic areas. And uh, as I was going along in the car, I come across this girl and... Uh, when I saw her, I, I told the driver to stop the car. I said, look, uh, I'm very intrigued by what's going on. And it was just such a powerful image, just seeing such a young girl with, you know, such a heavy load on her head. So we actually stopped, got off, and uh, this is when I took these pictures. And uh, just if you, I mean, if you can see, like, that look in her, in her eyes, it's it's... It's, you know, it to me it says so much. It's like she's frightened but also seems responsible. And it's like you look and you say, where's her childhood? Should should she be doing this at this age? You know, and clearly she's, she's gathering twigs and stuff for the family fire or food, etc. And when we asked ask the driver to ask her in their, their lingo, uh, she said that she actually does this every day or every second day just to uh, feed the fire to cook and stay warm. That picture, it, like, it always strikes out to me. It's one of my earliest memories when I, when I felt like helpless to help, to help you know, vulnerable children. And I remember leaving there thinking about it all the way to the point where we got so north, I was actually discussing with my uncle saying that, look, you know, children shouldn't have to live like this and I think we need to do something. And there was a, a very serious conversation, a subdued conversation to say that, you know, I want to find her and I want to adopt her and, you know, we should bring her to England and give her a better life. But as the journey went on, we saw more and more of this and, you know, you come to realize that that's, this is just one of so many. But this was, this was that picture, that first sort of incident that I can relate to her saying that, look, uh, Amal, there's more to life than making a lot of money, being rich, fancy cars and everything. You know, this is what our responsibility is. Nearly 90,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Some towns and villages were completely flattened. Muzaffarabad was one of the worst hit areas. Some families are still searching for their loved ones to this day. This is what the city looked like after the earthquake. All of a sudden the Pakistan earthquake hit in 2005 and all of a sudden it was scenes all over and I just desperately wanted to help. I like, we need to do something. Uh, obviously, f giving funds is, you know, one thing you can, everyone can do quite easily. So I was like, no, I, I believed I can do more. I was sat in Ramzan every day, waking up at Seher, watching this, and I was thinking, no, I need to be there. And from there, I just said, right, I need to engage myself actively. Firstly, you, you sit there and you, you feel overwhelmed, you feel useless, you think you're helpless, you think, ah, man, you know, I actually can't do anything for these people except give them money. 
but obviously that was that was changing my mind that like no i you can't go out there it's just an excuse what ex what reason you have you have the means you have the methods you know how to go you know you need to go and i just saw you know destitute children women you know harrowing pictures just sitting there and i was like no i want to i need to go so I sort of engaged myself with that. I was like, no, I'm going to go to Pakistan. I'm, I'm going to go help these people. So, you know, I just flew out over there and I went into the regions where I was told that no agency was going, no no help was being supplied because it was law and order situation. It was too dangerous to go in there. I was like, no, I'm going to go to these areas because they're the ones who need our help more than anyone. Not the people that are, can you can get to. Let's go to the people that are not serviceable. So I ended up going there and... I can't even explain to you the destruction I saw. I mean, it was it, it was just, it was tough. Just seeing that, I was like, oh my God. It was like, how insignificant you feel all of a sudden. You're like, these people have taken off their scarves off their heads and stuck them in twigs. Oh, sorry, stuck them in trees so they have shelter. Because they have no choice all of a sudden. All of a sudden you start thinking of what happened in Karbala and you think, oh my God. You know, it's sort of like, it's just harrowingly sad at the same time. It's like, I don't know how to explain it to you. It's just like, it really like, it, it really makes you question your whole being as a person. You're like, there's people out there in the world suffering like this and yet you sit in the Western world with every comfort. And the least we can do is go out and help them. So that's when I got involved in sort of the charity work, hands on. And then from there, from about 2005, 2006, that's it. I just started doing this pretty much as constantly as I could. This here is, uh, this was the maiden convoy to Pakistan. It was the first ever land convoy taken uh, from the UK to Pakistan. The medic first ever medical aid convoy in history. And uh, we managed to pull it off against the odds. It was there was so much uh, obstacles we faced, you know, the situation in Pakistan, the governments about getting the vehicles in, and uh, yeah, we took on the 14th of August 2011, we left England and uh, we made the journey over 11, 12 countries into Pakistan, taking uh, Eid gifts to distribute. We, so we left in Ramadan al Mubarak, and we got there for Eid and we distributed Eid gifts to the people that have been affected by the floods. And uh, we also delivered the vehicles, the ambulances that are now currently being used as a medical uh, vaccination of medical clinics. Bike quite late. I, oh, I didn't have a bike when, when I was like eight, nine, ten, something. I remember my, actually my brother went to university and I must have been about. 15, 16 when I, he came back and he sort of got me my first bike because my dad was quite strict. He was like, no, no, cycling outside is too dangerous. And it literally, it was just he said it was too dangerous. He didn't like it, so we weren't allowed to have a bike. So anyway, as we got older, when I was about 16, got a bike and I loved cycling. Me and my friends or my friend, we would cycle around everywhere, wherever we could go. You know, we were like, let's go on the bike. I always remember one of my, one of my friends who cycled to Palestine. And I'm always in awe of what he did. I was like, wow, you know, he cycled to Palestine. And I was always like, I want to do that. I sort of want to do that. I mean, this is like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, he did this. And I was like, well, like chuffed and proud of what he did, accomplished to do. So that was always sort of in the back of my mind. You know, that's something, that, you know, you know, I want to do sort of a, a bike ride or something of that nature. And then uh, I st just started thinking whilst I was cycling around Luton that, you know what? Maybe I should try to engage a Palestinian movement, try to make a difference in Palestine and we cycle on Palestine. So I actually ap approached a few people and there wasn't much positive feedback from it. So I thought maybe I should, I will cycle down to Vietnam or so, just maybe go a bit further. And uh, I would be thinking this as I'm cycling at night, you know, just cycling around Luton, thinking that maybe, you know, I can do this. And uh, I sat down and I thought, you know what, maybe I could just sort of cycling around the world, and I thought, that's a possibility. He said, uh, what do you think? Uh, he calls me Lala. He said, Lala, what do you think uh, about the cycle challenge? I want to do it. Um, now we need a new project, and we want to build an orphanage. And what do you feel? And we talked about it for a couple of weeks. A few people came around, and we were discussing it. And just one day, one evening, me and him are alone, and I said, Amr, 
do you want to do it? And I looked at him straight in the eye, do you want to do it? He said, of course. I said, well, right, we're doing it. We were working, we were working in his, uh, in, on, on his extension. And one day he just turned around and said to me, Abu Zar, Abu Zar um, just between me and you, what do you think of cycling around the world? And I said to him, you're mad. <laughs> Who'd want to cycle around the world? Um, he goes, yeah, don't tell anybody. But uh, I think me and you, my brother, we're going to cycle around the world. And I was like, okay then. So I took it for a joke. I took it as a joke. And I was like, yeah, okay. Because by that stage, I've known him for quite some time. I knew this guy was off his rockers anyway. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I knew the guy's all nuts. <laughs> um, so, and, and the idea of doing cycling mission had been kind of moved around a little bit. But despite that, I was I was still quite I was like taken back a bit. I didn't really know what to make. It was like, is this even possible? You know. He'd call me over every evening and he said to me, "Let's get ready. We need to start training. We need to start getting this. We need to start getting that. We need to start uh, preparing ourselves for this trip." I was like, "Okay." The day the day I went to Stockwood Park and the day that we were about to leave, the day that we were going to do the cycle ride around the world, um, that day it hit me. Because I had my family around me, I had my friends around me, um, and there was a big crowd just ready to send us off onto this trip. And I was thinking, am I really going? <laughs> am I really going to go and do this cycle ride? Uh, that time, yeah, it did. It hit me. It was just sort of a surreal feeling, like somber mood, like I'm gonna, hopefully, if, if I can, I'm gonna cycle around the world, I'll be back. Is it gonna take me 10 months? Is it gonna take me eight months? Is it gonna take me a year and a half? When am I actually gonna be back? So that was sort of all, everything was like, when is the next time I'm gonna be doing this? You know, I got from my bed thinking, when the next time I'm gonna sleep at home? While we were on our way to Folkestone, the roads, the hills, absolutely killing me. We had a support cyclist with us um, and he was literally towing me. So what he'd done, you know, the locks that you get on the bike, he'd have, if we, I had one on my bike, he had one on his. And what he'd done is he put them both together, wrapped one around my bike and he was holding the other end. So he'd cycle forward and he'd pull me at the same time. I'd given up cycling before I'd even left the UK. Put it that way. In France, it was it was basically about 30, 40 miles straight run straight into Belgium. So we got into Europe. I think we had me and Abu Zar, We had a decent tailwind, and we just got on with it. We thought we'd we'd, uh, we'd stay in France, but because of the tailwind, we just shot straight across into Belgium. We got into Belgium. We were still sort of like sort of still sort of obviously adapting to Europe. So I'm cycling behind this guy and next minute what you there's there's some sort of uh, what was it a metal slab sheet wasn't it Met, sort of. um, some sort of metal sheet in the middle of nowhere it's the woods we're cycling through and it was wet at the time so I'm cycling behind him he's cycling in front of me and all I see is the back of his bike slip out and he had a great fall the great fall yeah yeah so I stood there <laughs> and before I, I didn't throw the bike away or anything, so I, you know, I got off my bike, I put it on the stand, and then I went up to him and I got to him, you're all right, is everything all right? And, and I think he wasn't breathing for a couple of seconds. Couple yeah. Of seconds. yeah, it felt like, and once sort of I re-engaged, like I was like, <gasps> all right, I'm okay, I'm okay, and I sort of like did a spin walking around, and he's like, he's saying to me like, Are you okay, you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay now. Like once, obviously, the three, a couple of seconds or whatever. It I think was. it was this handles of yeah. I feel this the is bike this is dug into his ribs, fractured stroke, broke my rib and quite painful.
I will stay with you in one condition. And we honestly will stay in Turkey if you cycle with us to the border. Do you know what? I'm not even walking, man. How can I cycle? I'm 90 pounds and 90 kilos. But I wish I could do something like this. Something like you really. You will change your whole life forever. I can change easily. I changed my life many, many times. But not all of the time, just for myself. Mm. Maybe this time for the people. As you may already know, or have updated before, is that we've been stuck in Istanbul due to the incompetent staff of Turkish Airlines. Yesterday we were given our boarding passes 10 minutes before the flight left. The gate has already closed and they issued our boarding passes. Uh, by the time we before we even left the check-in desk, the uh, gate was closed. Anyway, this turned into a huge problem for us. We got down there, the gate has closed and we spent the next five or six hours in the Turkish airport trying to locate our luggage, trying to sort out our flights and more important than anything, at this point, the uh, immigration service at Turkish Airlines thought we were some kind of crooks or we were trying had uh, illegitimate passports and uh, that turned into a fiasco which resulted in me leaving my credit cards, debit cards at the counter which mysteriously disappeared. After this point we were completely lost in Istanbul, we didn't know what to do. So there was a brother that we stayed with uh, his, in his apartment complex, our brother Gokan who stood next to me here. We rang him for advice. Out of the kindness of his heart he said, I'm not going to give you advice, I'm coming to the airport, which is not what we expected. Since then, this brother has been a blessing for us. He came to the airport, he sorted everything out for us and by his blessings we managed to locate our credit card, debit cards. We got them back, he took us home, he looked after us, he would not charge us for anything. He said you are our guests now, you are on the Mercy Worldwide Cycle Challenge for Orphans. I'm doing this for the orphans and you are my guest. He looked after us, he's brought us back to the airport today. As of last night, I'd say approximately 3-4 hours, this brother has spent on the phone fighting with Turkish Airlines to get us a free ticket to uh, continue our flight because it's their mistake. After numerous phone calls and a day and a half, he's managed to convince Turkish Airlines that it's your fault and your fault alone that this happened and they have now given us free tickets to go on to our uncontinued journey. This is Amar Nazir and Abu Dhar Kazmi on the World Cycle Challenge for Orphans 2015, uh, part of Mercy Worldwide. Uh, we're here in Tbilisi. Uh, we've just turned over just over 2,000 miles and we've had our first mechanical breakdown. And as they say, when it rains, it pours. Uh, we've had our bikes uh, yesterday while cycling. Uh, the, uh, the bicycle Abu Zer was cycling on, uh, the crank, it, it, it stopped working basically, it had a malfunction and therefore we couldn't cycle anymore. So we had to hitchhike the rest of the journey to Tbilisi. Georgia, uh, my bike broke down. Basically the crank, it uh, seized. So I'd have to put <laughs> 100 BHP just to move that. Um, and Amar would say to me that it's because you're fat and all that weight that you're putting onto the pedals has seized the crank. So we, uh, what we had, we had to hitchhike the ride about I think it's 20, 30 miles up the road just to find um, a bike shop that could repair it. What, Daddy? Yeah. Come here. We started feeling a lot more hospitality in that part of the world. And then we came across, uh, once we got to Azerbaijan, we felt that was one of the first countries that was overwhelmingly like sort of supportive of what we were doing. So there it was literally people were like, even at the border cheering us on. I remember driving through, the, uh, cycling through the border and I started just cheering like, yay. And like, oh, everyone just started like cheering and clapping like, oh. And uh, they were just sort of huddling around us, taking pictures. And the more we went down into Azerbaijan and towards Baku, uh, we noticed that everybody was like, sort of wanting to take pictures with us, coming on, seeing on the side of the road, running up to us. And uh, just, just being friendly, that's where we started feeling the real hospitality you know people go out their way to get us food they would uh, you know get us drinks and uh, we started feeling sort of like yeah you know this is what the trip's going to be about hospitality and 
the way people receive us. 100 euros. How much get mugged in Azerbaijan? Salam Azerbaijan. Salam. Hello, hello. Masjid. Masjid. Ha, bi ne git. Allah akbar. Allah. And masjid eat halal. Halal, halal, halal. Kullo. Kullo. Sure. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Musliman. Azerbaijan was uh, one of my favorite countries. Uh, the people were nice, very hospitable. We'd cycle past and they'd go, do, do, do. We'd get scared, but they were showing love. They'd stop, they'd come running across to us, they'd take photos with us. Uh, selfie is a big thing. So everybody would stand uh, next to us and they'd be like, selfie, selfie. Uh, these people uh, want to give a shout out to Mercy Worldwide. Mercy Worldwide! Yes! The desert of Uzbekistan, that really took the toll. Um, I, I, there was times Amar was saying, every, every time we'd have a conversation, he'd say, Lala, if it wasn't for the orphans, I'd come home right now. And I said, well, do you want an exit plan? You know, shall I prepare an exit plan? Uh, no, we've got to do it for the orphans. And those two, three weeks in Uzbekistan, I, I, I think, were so hard because they were going through stretches where there was no roads. It was sand, desolate. And looking back at some of the pictures and remembering the stories, yeah, I would say that if we were going to stop, that was the time. That desert, that desert was so incredibly tough. So incredibly tough. It was like we was we got sun. We were getting sunburnt because there was no shade from the sun, and it was like there was nothing. It was just like you know, no roads. So you know we were getting really sore because they were like the you know the, the there was just rubble we were having to go over, or there was sand and it was just like it would just started wearing us down every day. You know we're like oh, how tough? Why is this so tough? How are we gonna get over this? You know. We've got another, I don't know, 600 miles to go. Cycling through the desert was uh, the most difficult part of this whole journey. Uh, we were we were black, we were burnt, sunburnt, um, dehydrated, and we had no energy in us whatsoever. We wouldn't, we and armor, we 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 wouldn't carry um, much of a supply with us. Uh, just maybe a bottle of water and a couple of uh, bars of Snickers, um, and that would keep us going. Um, but once we hit the desert, a couple of days into it, uh, we couldn't cycle. The roads were tough. It was just sand. Majority of the time, we'd have to get off the bike and walk with the bikes. Or if we could cycle, uh, we'd have we'd get stuck in sandstorms, where we'd get blown. The headwind would be so tough uh, that it'd be very very difficult for us to cycle in. I've had enough of the desert. Someone told me it was to Nukas, they lied. It's to Bukhara. For 10 days we've been in the flipping desert. And it's boring, and there's nothing to see, and it's hot, and we've had enough. So sort yourself out, you desert. It plays with you mentally. Mentally, I don't know how to explain this, but it's tough. Um, you don't see no civilization for days and days. I don't know how to explain it. I didn't want to cycle. I just want to get off the bike and just stop. But then the thought in my head that we're in the middle of nowhere and the only way we're going to get across to the other side is cycle. The mental aspect of it is more harder than any physical aspect of the, of the journey. 
So mentally, it was a case of, you know, you wake up and you think, I've got to cycle another 80 miles or 100 miles or whatever you've got to do. And even then, it's just going to be 80 miles or not 100 miles of the same thing. Nothing to do but just cycle and, you know, it's you stop conversing with the person with you because there's not much to talk about anymore and you're just trying to cycle. You're working to get to the end of that day, but knowing full well that once that day finishes, you've got exactly the same day coming up after that. So it's something you try not to overthink about. You try to enjoy around you. So you try to make the you try to make the atmosphere a lot more light. Where there's always there's like this tension in the air. Like you know, you look around, you just complete quietness, wilderness, but quiet. And if if you if you think too much about it, it just start it just start breaking you down. So you just gotta like snap out of it. Yesterday, uh, coming through the mountains, we had a slight problem. Uh, Abu Zar got the two bob bits, so uh, he had to hitch a ride for a couple of miles. So I told him to wait 15 miles ahead. Uh, I started cycling. After about 10 miles or 8 miles, a thunderstorm out of nowhere started with heavy rain. As I was cycling on the side of the road, trying to make it to Abu Zar, uh, there was a gentleman in the name of Rahim Jan who saw me, who started shouting, saying, stop cycling, come in. So he took me in. That left Abu Zar about eight miles ahead of me and I was behind him. I couldn't contact him, no phone, contact nothing. So Abu Zar were here at the end of this tunnel and he was waiting where uh, Isam Torabik. Torabik took him inside yeah. into uh, his uh, little yeah, compartment, so out of the rain. And then Muhammad uh, Abu Zar started saying to Abdul Hamid, Hamid Karzai. <laughs> uh, Abdul Hamid, aka Hamid Karzai that look, my brother is back there somewhere, I need to find him. They tried to feed Abu Zar, Abu Zar said, I do not want to eat. He said, I need to find uh, Amir, where is he? So this gentleman in the rain, got on his motorbike, started going up and down the tunnel or beyond trying to find me. But to no luck, they came back, they told Abu Zar, Abu Zar said no. He was absolutely drenched because it was raining. So then what they did was, they borrowed a car <laughs> over there, which must be roughly about 300 <laughs> years old. And they started uh, driving back with Abu Zar. They got to uh, a check post. They checked the CCTV. The CCTV confirmed that I left the post about two hours ago. The post had seen me uh, cycling quite fast. And that was because I didn't have my passport on me. Abu Zar had it and in case they stopped me, I thought I don't want to start this headache. So I just shot through the check post. And uh, then they asked a few locals and then they were told that Amir is with Rahim Jan. We've seen him and then these guys started celebrating. Mind you, by now it was half eight, it was pitch dark. I was sat in a little room with the duvet around me, all cold, and I was just about to go to sleep. I thought, I'll find Abu Zar in the morning now. I can't go outside, it's too cold, I didn't have the clothes. But these guys turned up with uh, another, like, uh, army guy, you can say, and uh, they found me, and they took me from Rahim Jan, and then they tried to bring me in this vehicle. But uh, three miles up the road, the vehicle conked out, wouldn't uh, start again and then my brother here had to come back in the tunnel get his pickup truck which is behind us see. and then he told us with that vehicle the car and us guys all in tow we made it back here after three four hours they kept us the night they fed us and they gave us a good breakfast this morning and they wished us on our way during all this time, they kept telling Abu Zar, do not worry, this place is very safe, people are very nice, very hospitable, and that's been ringing true. We didn't have any problems, the police, everybody was quite helpful. So it was a minor glitch, just an interesting day. Uh, lots happened, but these guys saved the day. Ahmed Karzai and Yunus Khan. You're gonna miss these days. You're gonna go home, you're gonna cry for months. Then you're gonna be like, let's do another world cycle challenge. 
I stopped at a point, I think it was in Uzbekistan, um, and I got off my bike and I told Amr, I can't do this anymore. I just can't cycle. I've got no energy in me. I've not got the power to get back on this bike and cycle. And he said to me, so what do you want to do? I said, I, I, I'll, I'll do anything, but I don't want to cycle. I just can't do it. It's, it's not for me. And he turned around and said to me that, you know, you've come all this way and um, I'm sure you can cycle another 40, 50, 60 miles up the road. And I said to him, no, I'm a year ago and I'll probably hitch a ride and I'll meet you somewhere. And we didn't even find a ride or anything. Nothing, nothing would go past. We'd be waiting. And he turned around and said to me, what do you want us to do now? We, I think we stopped there for about an hour. Um, I sat down, I had a break. I got back onto the bike and I said, let's do it. So we started cycling again. I think I, got, I must have cycled about another 60 miles. But I think we've done about 100 miles that day. Um, that was one of the moments that I just, I'd, I'd given up. But then I'd uh, recovered and got back onto the bike. Um, but once we got into Tajikistan, um, I couldn't do it anymore. Like physically, I could get on the bike and I could cycle no problem. But mentally, um, I couldn't think. I was blank. I'd like shut down. I think Ahmed could see on my face that I didn't want to move from there. We'd, I was ready. Um, I would have left if Ahmed didn't say anything. But he turned around and said to me, he gave me an option. He said to me, do you want to go home? And I said to him, yeah, I do want to go home. And he said to me, okay, you better go inside and pack this bike together. And I, I froze. I shut down at that time. And I was like, no, I can't do this. I can't leave you. He just sort of mentally capitulated, just broken mentally. And I looked at him and I just felt so bad for him. I was like, you know what, Abu Zar, you might as well go home from here. And he just like looked at me and he like pulled his head. He's like, how can I do that? How can I leave you here? And I was like, listen, mate, you don't have a choice. I'm not literally dragging you, you know, along. It is what it is. I'm going to go, you don't have to do the challenge. I have to complete the challenge. Go on from here. So he goes, as literally, he was, he was like, okay. Like, okay, and I realized, you know, for him to actually say that to me, he was just mentally had given up. Well, I'm off to the roof of the world, and if there's a, a way of getting to the roof of the world, I guess it's on your own. So I'm off, hopefully, gonna meet a few disciples on the way. If I don't, inshallah, with everybody's du'as and prayers, I'm gonna get roof of the world, get up to Kyrgyzstan, China, and into Pakistan for a well deserved break, inshallah. So this is Alman Azeev now on the world cycle challenge for orphans. Solo. Take care, man. Amr has always been the sort of person that never, get, you know, once he started something, he doesn't want to give up. And that is one thing that I had in the back of my head that he's doing this for the orphans. And I know Amr is a, a very charitable person. Uh, he's a humanitarian, um, and to do anything for the orphans, he'd carry on. He'd carry on. I knew he would finish this cycle ride no matter what happens. One of the sports cyclists, Abu Khazar Kazmi, he actually decided to come back just before the Karakoram Highway. And Amr was on his own then. And that was very, very dangerous part. And I don't think we can even tell you the dangers uh, that Amr would have faced coming in from China into Pakistan, uh, being a Shia, uh, and you, I'm sure you know the viewers will know about Gilgit Baltistan, what's happened there with the the Shias there. So that was a huge scare for me. Oh no, he's on his own. He's going to come down that route. So yeah, I thought a lot about giving him the exit plan, and I think in a roundabout sort of way, I did give him the exit plan. But Amr is so determined and so strong-willed, he wouldn't have any of it. He would not have it. Yeah. 
I remember the first time I sort of hugged him and I lifted him. He had lost so much weight. Uh, I can't remember his exact weight, but I think he must have been about 50 kilos. I literally lifted him with, you know, uh, it was like I'm lifting a shopping bag. He was that weak. He'd lost a lot of weight. You could see the tension on his face. Um, that was good. When he had that month to just sort of recoup, it was during Ramadan, so, you know, he got to do his religious obligations. Mercy Worldwide has been involved in humanitarian projects around the world for the past seven years. Flood relief work in Pakistan since 2010. The first land convoy of ambulances from the UK to Pakistan. Using ambulances as mobile health units. Promoting vaccination campaigns. Delivering food packages to victims and orphans in Gaza. In 2015, we've organized the World Cycle Challenge for Orphans, a 12,000-mile ride across 33 countries in approximately 10 months. It was during Muharram uh, in 2007. Uh, you know, uh, a bunch of brothers, we got together. Obviously, it was, the, uh, you know, it was a very spiritual Muharram that year, and we just thought we should do something uh, to help uh, people who are in need. Um, and one of the first things I remember we did to raise funds was uh, do a DVD for Abathar Halvaji, a uh, very famous name. Uh, after that, we did a, a DVD on the method of wuzu. So we just slowly, you know, uh, built up on that. And Amr was always our guy uh, who went to, you know, do the on-ground work. So he's been to Gaza, Syria, the Pakistan floods, you know, taken convoys to Pakistan. So, yeah, over the years, it's grown from just wanting to help a few brothers, uh, brothers and sisters, to actually being quite a, a large charity. The whole reason we did the World Cycle Challenge was actually to make an orphanage uh, so that we could educate these. Uh, uh, or we, we, you know, we didn't even want to call it an orphanage. We wanted to just call it a home. Uh, where we could educate these uh, kids to actually see a better uh, better aspect of humanity, basically. Um, and one of my personal dreams as the founding trustee of this charity has always been sustainable livelihoods. And it's one of the things that I, I've got a dream, and inshallah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willing, we will do it, is to create sustainable livelihoods, whether that's through vocational centers, a vocational training, whatever you know the uh, demand may be in pakistan i know that ladies are taught sewing embroidery, embroidery with the gents we were thinking about you know giving them a skill like elect electrical work um, you know other uh, car mechanics anything that will make it that they don't have to rely on charity mm. so that's really our ultimate aim we're only young seven years old uh, we don't get any institutional funding so we're just backed up by brothers and sisters who help us all the time. <laughs> because the bikes are covered in so much muck and dirt, we had to obviously clean them. And uh, we weren't sure that the hotel staff would let our bikes into the hotel rooms or anything first. But uh, eventually I, I came downstairs and I just picked the bikes up and I took them up into our bedrooms on I think it was second floor. Yeah. And uh, so what I did is I got, got into my towel and I took the bike apart. So I'd go into the shower and I'd put the wheel into the shower. So you, you've got a picture of this. you got a picture of this. You've got Abu Zar wearing a towel right around, around his waist. That's it. And then he's got the bike frame. <laughs> A minus two <laughs> wheels inside the shower cubicle Standing with the shower head, vertical. yeah, the bike started, and he's showering away at the bike and it was absolutely hilarious just to <laughs> see that and the problem with me was I was like begging him please stop and he was like what's so funny but with, with my fractured or well, broken rib it was so painful for me to laugh it was like really extremely painful because it just happened a couple of hours earlier so I was like literally creasing over the bed, holding my chest down and saying, Zeri, stop it. And uh, that is, I think, one of the highlights. I just, I mean, we often <laughs> joke about it, that the way you wash the bikes. He literally had a shower with the bike. Yeah, both of them. Both of them. So this is, uh, this is my baby, which I'm quite proud of. 
and uh, it's quite new when I first got it. Obviously, it was it was brand new when I got it, and uh, you can see it sort of uh, worn out and stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, so every day I got on this bike and I cycled. I was always more worried about the, the bike being safe. So wherever I stayed, the primary focus or my primary objective was to make sure the bike safe. But if I felt the bike wasn't safe, I wasn't going to stay there. Or I wasn't. I was like, no, the bike's coming in my bedroom if it has to. You know, I do have a special affinity towards it, and it's something that I'm pretty sure I will treasure forever. I sort of feel a part of it. It's, it's like this is this. You know, it's not only my bike. It's sort of me. You know, it's just like you know. I mean. The things we thought, the things we did, and just sitting there and on the bike, and you know, it was just, it was such an integral part of my life for so long. Hello everyone, or oh, hello no one, this is Arman Azir on the World Cycle Challenge 2015 for Orphans. All I can say is, it's been very tough, with a capital T. Every morning I wake up, I just don't want to get on that bike, feel a bit tired, feel a little depressed, I've got so much to do. And then once I get on the road, after a couple of hours, when I've done about 30, 40 miles, then my brain sort of tells me, okay, this day is nearly done, and you'll be hitting 100 miles soon, and then you can relax. But always the first two hours in the morning, a real head mess same routine same setup I get up about an hour before sunrise I pray get my stuff together and then sort of wait for the sun to rise which is getting later every day by a couple of minutes it's not easy doing 100 miles every day on your own but it's got to be done I guess and that's what's got to see me through and see this challenge through and I keep saying God bless them orphans God give them orphans a prosperous life look after them give us the strength and ability to look after an orphan because it's our responsibility and it's for that reason and that reason alone that I'm continuing with the cycle challenge. So once I landed in Australia I was like wow the th thing that kept coming to my mind was like wow I just cycled Australia just kept thinking wow I've cycled Australia and the people obviously could speak English it was like no problems it was all the courtesy that we're used to all the you know the, the niceness that we have here and Everybody was, you know, so courteous and it was just good to be able to, you know, not worry about every single little thing that you normally do, you know, it was like, even from the airport, people were like, so helpful, telling me that you, you can do this, you can put your bike together here, you can go over here, follow this route, do this. And I just felt that both Australia and New Zealand, the people were so hospitable to me. Everybody was stopping like all of a sudden, you know, you're like in England, they can see there's a guy, there's a foreign guy on a bike. He's got the bike, panniers, it looks like touring, he's been around the world or he's, he's on a world trip, you can tell. So more often than not, people were wanting to stop and converse with me. And then my top, my cycling top said what I was doing so they could read it. So that was you know, obviously intriguing people stopping me, having a chat. And everybody sort of helped me. My elder brother, Mr. Ajmal Nazir, who's over there, bless him, he had promised that he would cycle South America with me. Now, he's a last minute dot com kind of guy. He's like, you know, and I'd been saying to him, listen, you need to prepare, you need to get ready. And it was a case of whilst I was sat in Australia, New Zealand were trying to get his bike and equipment together. 
So he also said I can only m- make it, it at this date. So which gave me a bit more time in New Zealand, which I wasn't complaining about. So anyway, flew over, hit Peru. And uh, in Peru, I was waiting for him, I think a day. And then obviously I was seeing my brother after what, eight months now. So I, I remember meeting him, gave him a big hug. He sort of picked me up and we were like really happy. What's going on? Nothing, but I'm working, you should try it someday. <laughs> it's, it's a new experience. How about cycling? <laughs> Bro, me and done that, got the t-shirt. Since I left Pakistan and I got to South America, you were like the only family, well, since that three or four month period is when I met you. And I like I met you, I was like, yeah, big bros here. A part of me was like, yeah, someone's with me now, it's not going to be boring. And also, it's gonna get exciting because he's gonna blow a few gaskets on the way. So I think for me that was good having you on that last bit of the journey there. But I think uh, after about a week of it, you were like, "I think I made a mistake coming here." Which was the most toughest country in South America you found? For me, I think it was it was Paraguay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think <laughs> apart from the Chaco. The trans charcoal. Uh, it was a case of uh, the heat, uh, and uh, the, the boredom, uh, I guess, because it was just like constant, uh, straight, uh, no variations day after day. And we were out there for I think what, what twenty days. <laughs> <laughs> it <was> like <laughs> hospitality, humanity, humility. Uh, a, a lot of aspects. It, it was just real genuine people. Yeah. Uh, and, and not to say that others weren't, uh, but but that whole interaction uh, with, with 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 that community was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's pretty much my. I always say the same thing. That I say, listen, the hospitality and the interaction with people and how, you know, like just how selfless people are opposed to how selfish we are in our modern in our lives living in the west or developed part of the world and how selfless they are and caring towards the people it's Amr Nazir in back in UK on the multi worldwide world cycle joint 2015 and I finally made it back to UK you know what this is probably one of the best days of cycling for me. I'm really enjoying it being back in England. When he came into Luton, well, that was that was just a joyous, momentous occasion for all of us, particularly for me, because I I was the guy who was you know responsible for his safety. I was the guy who was always worried about where he is, which desert he is, is he in touch with me, and just seeing him drive down you know uh, Berry Park with you know a couple of hundred people waiting for him. It was a sense of relief I cannot describe to you. Wow, we've done it. He's a Lutonian who's cycled 12,000 miles across the world. Please join us in welcoming him back and congratulating him on this amazing achievement for Mercy Worldwide and most importantly for the orphanage. There was a gulp in the throat and a little tear in the eye. I was just, to be honest with you, I was just so relieved that he was okay, you know, and he's back in one piece um, and he looked a lot more healthier than he was in certain parts of the uh, of the trip so I was glad that you know he's just back in one piece Alhamdulillah thank God I came in and I met everybody he was there with his camera and I could see he had this look on his face I think he wasn't too sure how I was gonna receive him so I sort of uh, didn't say anything to him I, I, I believe I didn't even greet him initially and uh, I didn't greet you did I no I stayed back I was too busy filming and I thought I'd uh, let everything die down and then I'll meet him yeah so I think then uh, I got up on stage and uh, on the platform and started talking to people and uh, you know I thanked a few people that had helped me throughout the journey before prep and stuff and then uh, I told them there's one particular one person in particular that 
you know, I think everybody uh, should be proud of and, you know, we need to appreciate his efforts. And then obviously I explained why, what kind of person Abu Zar is and sort of the journey that we had together and then him having leave me. But looking back at the journey, I knew that he did a very important part of the journey and had he not been with me. And I pretty much expressed that really well. And everybody felt it was quite a, it was a very emotional reunion. You know, and if you can see the footage and people saw that when I called him up on stage and I thanked him and he sort of embraced me, I think there was a lot of emotion in, in that hug that, you know, it's sort of like we've got it off our chest, we're here, you know, we, we suffered out in the road there, but now we, we're happy to have done that. <laughs> After three. Three, two, one. Hey! I'm happy and relieved the mind to accomplish that. That's finished. It's over. That challenge is over. I don't need to worry about that. And now the bigger picture is the responsibility of the charity and us guys to make sure that we deliver this this project in its entirety, which is for the orphans. Because I know you 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 know you, we can talk for days and months and years. The cycle challenge will be talked about because it was one man who set off around the world. But the thing that makes that special and important to me is the element that says for orphans. If you take out four orphans, it, it it doesn't have the same, you know, reasoning for me. It'll be like it was an expedition and what it was something I did for myself. But the bit that way it says for the orphans, and I think the delivery of that and once the orphanage is complete or does come to fruition is the point where the actual challenge for me will be over and complete. So I physically might not be doing, you know, I, I can sort of go back to normality sort of the way I live and stuff. But until that challenge, as until, sorry, that orphanage is not built and complete and running, up until that time, the challenge for me is not over. And the project has not been a success until that. So that for me is, is the point that I wait for to have closure on the complete project.